Well, good morning. Great to be with you today. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, if you have your Bibles, would you please pull them out and turn them to Matthew chapter 26. We'll start with verse 36. Matthew 26, verse 36. I say this all the time. Uh, we're a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. I believe having your Bible in front of you and reading it with, with us, you'll gain so much more. The Bible pr promises that when the Bible is read, when it's taught, that it won't come back void. If you don't have a Bible with you, don't worry. Just open up your phone. You can Google Matthew chapter 26 and then uh, follow along. If you're new to the church, we've been walking through the Gospel of Matthew for a long time, verse by verse, as much as we possibly can, which has brought us to what we call the, the final days. Uh, we're in chapters 26 uh, through 28. In fact, um, this morning we're unpacking the night before he died. But as a quick reminder before we dive in, uh, the reason why Matthew writes his Gospel is to prove to his fellow countrymen that Jesus is the Old Testament Messiah. Uh, he's writing to a Jewish audience. That's why if you read Matthew, there are so many Old Testament passages that he uses over and over and over again. Many times in Matthew, it will say something like, for uh, it was this happened to fulfill what was prophesied, and then they quote something from uh, the Old Testament. So in the end, Matthew is a 28 chapter argument using the Old Testament Israel's history, then now Jesus in real time uh, through his teaching ministry and miracles that he is that guy. Now, uh, today we're really coming to kind of like this massive climatic moment to the last week of Jesus' life. And again, I've said this many times, but obviously the last week of Jesus' life was really important. There's many theological things and teachings and interactions that happened. We know it was really important because the amount of time that all four gospels give us on just the last week of his life. For instance, in Matthew, uh, in the English, it's approximately 23,000 words, the entire book, and he spends 8,400 of those words on just the last week, which if you do the math, that's approximately 35% of his entire book is given to us about the last week. And so it shows us it's an incredibly important portion of scripture. And then today, we kind of enter into this climatic moment in that last week. We enter into holy ground. Now, before we dive in, just kind of get us up to speed, what has happened so far that sets up this moment. So far, Judas has already made a deal with the chief priest to betray Jesus. So far, Jesus has acknowledged his impending death and resurrection at what we call the Last Supper. In the very immediate previous passage, Jesus shares the reality with the 12 apostles, those who are closest to him, those who he loves and trusts. He tells them that you're all gonna desert me. Uh, it's in that previous passage that Peter stands up and emphatically denies that. And he says, even if all these losers fall away, I added that, but it's pretty much what he's saying. If all of them fall away, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. How'd that work out? And then it goes on to say all the others said the same. So now it's late Thursday night, Friday morning, Scholars say probably around 12, 1 o'clock on Friday morning, with all that pressure, heartache, with the cross just hours away, Jesus is now overwhelmed with anguish. Uh, an anguish that it's impossible to put words to. We cannot understand his soul's torment. Why? Well, a lot of it's just from what's been built up, these things I just laid out. But also we have to remember that Jesus is Messiah God. Uh, he knows the Bible backwards and forwards. He is literally called the Word of God. So he knows what the Old Testament says he's about to do. For instance, you can throw it up on the screen. Isaiah says this of him. It's, he's described a man of sorrows. It says, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not as he's experiencing Surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, so our sin on him, and his wounds were healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord, Yahweh, has laid on him all of our sin. He knows this is coming. In the 33 years of Jesus' life in this world as God incarnate, as God in human flesh, he had been constantly exposed to the sorrows of life. He was more aware of them than anyone that's ever lived because scripture tells us he knew the hearts of men. Multiple times in scripture it says something like, he knew what they were thinking, or he knew their hearts. 
And so he experienced people's suffering. Jesus not only saw people suffer like you and I do, and even at times empathize, we may even feel bad about it, but because of his supernatural ability as savior, he also felt their pain. Because of his purity, because of his supernatural empathy, he experienced a grief and sorrow like none other because he experienced it all. You and I can walk through this room full of believers and we don't know what we are going through. Jesus shows up and he experiences all pain, all sorrow, all heartache, all anxiety because of the fallen world we live in, because of sin, disease, unbelief, ignorance, rebellion, rejection, disobedience, suffering, poverty, loss, even death, he experienced that suffering while he lived. As I've laid out multiple times, when Lazarus died, it simply says he wept. He was gonna raise Lazarus in just a minute or two, but he wept, why? Because of the suffering of the people he loved. Because of his compassion throughout his ministry, he would often give temporary relief to, relief to people who were suffering, And so we see him heal people, cast out demons, feed hungry people, raise people from the dead. But even though Jesus saw it all and felt it all, even though he experienced the fullness of sorrow in ways that we'll never be able to understand because of the fullness of his complete absorption of others' pain, heartache, suffering, and grief. And yet with all that said, today we move into a passage, we move into a level of sorrow, sadness, and suffering that I would argue that although we may try, can never be understood by any person that's ever lived, no matter the suffering they've experienced. This sorrow is so severe that when we comprehensively look at the story in all four gospels, what Jesus experienced, it says it evoked loud crying. There was sobbing, there was tears. Luke tells us, that Jesus was so overwhelmed, Luke being a doctor, he says he even sweat blood, which is a real medical condition called hemodrosis that is caused by severe anguish and stress. This story, this event is a momentous experience in the life of a Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ in the middle of Friday night in the, in the day he's about to die. And so with that set up, we are now entering into the Garden of Gethsemane which I told you this is gonna happen. I was just there a couple weeks ago, so when I was there, (laughs) the Garden of Gethsemane is interesting because it's on the Mount of Olives and it oversees, it's literally looking right at the temple. Put yourself in a stadium, you're in a nosebleed section and you're overseeing the field. He is seeing the temple where he's about to be betrayed, trial, he's gonna be beaten, and then he can see Golgotha right off where he will be eventually crucified. So let's take a moment to read this passage in its entirety. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word? Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, if you're there, it says this. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. It means oil press. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to the point of death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, I want your will, not mine. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you, you, uh, could you not watch one hour with me? Watch and pray that, you're, that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, If this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them for a third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. My betrayer is at hand. And all God's people said, may you have a seat. Today, you and I, because God has allowed us to, the Holy Spirit gave it to Matthew, we truly walk into a holy, sacred ground. This is a divine, holy moment that he has led us in on, and the reality is this experience of Jesus' sorrow, his grief, his suffering in this moment defies comprehension. It surpasses our ability to grasp. But there are some insights here that I think are incredibly powerful, insights that I believe are life-changing, insights that if we can, with his help, grasp, make him all the more glorious, all the more worthy of our worship, and then because of that, hopefully, quite frankly, your allegiance, and then with his help, your obedience. 
Now, to understand the outcomes of this passage and how we can apply some practical things to our everyday life, become more and more like our Savior Jesus, to allow this passage to come a bit more alive for us, there's a bit of a theological conversation that we have to have that we don't talk a lot about. See, there's a wide variety of opinions on Satan. A lot of people who love the Lord are Christians who are incredibly intelligent. There's a wide variety of opinions, particularly though on Satan's knowledge of what was going on when Jesus came to earth and then his capabilities based on that knowledge. I'll say that another way. There's a wide variety of opinions on the abilities that God allowed Satan to have while on earth. So the question is, what did Satan actually know when Jesus was here? Regardless of those capabilities, Satan knows scripture better than any one of us in this room. He quotes it multiple times. He knows it well. And therefore, he also knew the prophecies of a coming Messiah. He knew that the Messiah was going to come and bear the weight of sins through his death. So regardless if Satan has any kind of special foreknowledge of understanding of the future or events that are going to come, I believe, as many scholars do, that Satan knew exactly what Jesus had come to do because scripture foretold it. I believe Satan knew that Jesus not only come to set up the church to be an avenue of saving the world, but I also believe Satan knew that Jesus had come to die, to be a ransom, to be a substitution for all people, to die on that cross for our sins. And because of that, I think he was doing everything he could to stop it from happening, at least the way God intended it. He wanted him dead, but not as a sacrifice. And then once he found out that it was going to happen regardless of his efforts, then he tried to keep Jesus dead, but he couldn't. Just in case you're wondering, the tomb is empty. He defeated death, the only power that Satan had. And so when that didn't work, he then tried to create as many conspiracies that he could to make the resurrection look like a hoax. The number one reason, again, I believe this is because God revealed it in the Old Testament, which Satan knew. Secondly, though, Satan trying to stop Jesus. Previous to Gethsemane, we have knowledge of two temptations that Satan set in front of Jesus. The first temptation, which is the most comprehensive that we have, is given to us in Matthew chapter four. You don't need to turn there. But the Holy Spirit sends Jesus out into the desert to be tempted, it says, by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, in which he goes into what I would call a supernatural fast. The reason why I call it a supernatural fast is because you and I, we can fast from food for 40 days. It's miserable. I've never done it, but I know people who have. But it's impossible to fast from water for 40 days. The human being can survive about three days without water, and yet we know, Scripture tells us, that he fasted from both for 40 days. So in complete, utter dependence on God the Father in his humanity, this was a miracle. So when Jesus was in this weakened state in his human body, so he's unbelievably hungry and thirsty, it's then Satan in the desert begins to tempt. Which, by the way, what does he use as a temptation? Scripture. Three times he quotes it. Totally misuses it. By the way, be careful of that. You know, make sure that when you have Scripture in mind that is not being misused. But he's using Scripture to tempt Jesus to do what? to take what he deserved. What does he deserve? Scripture tells us that he's going to become obedient, even obedient to death on a cross. And because of that, he'll be lifted to the highest place. That's what he deserves. And because of that, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? That's what he deserves. Yet for God's glory and the salvation of humanity, Jesus willingly laid that down for a time. So Satan, again, is trying to get Jesus to take what he deserves will receive all praise, but he wants him to do it out of God's will, quite frankly, prematurely. He's saying, Jesus, if you remember the story, take your kingdom now. You don't deserve the cross. That's not the road you need to go down. And if Jesus had taken him up on that offer to take prematurely what he already deserved and not followed the plan of the Father to the cross, what would have happened? What does it mean to us? eternity without him, then Satan ultimately would win. See, Satan already knows his destiny. That's why multiple times in scripture where Jesus encounters a demon, the demons say something like, wait, 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 time out. It's not our time yet. Have you caught that? They know there's an end. They know they have an expiration date. It's not our time yet. He knows his ultimate destiny, 
What he's trying to do is take as many of us down with him as possible. The second temptation comes in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is with the disciples again, and he tells them, I am going to go to Jerusalem, I will be killed, and I will be raised on the third day. Which again, time out, sidestep. Even if Satan had not known what the plan was up to this point, I think he knows it now. Jesus says this three times to the disciples, not just once, three times in Matthew. I'm gonna go to Jerusalem, I'm gonna die, that's the plan. And I'm gonna raise again on the third day. Satan was gonna do anything he could to stop it. He understood the Old Testament. He understood the purpose of sacrifice. He heard Jesus said, I'm gonna die and rise again. He heard John call Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sin of the world. Now, in this moment, Jesus says in Matthew 16, I'm gonna die and rise again. Then right afterwards, Peter stands up and he says this, never, Lord, you should ne- this should never happen to you. I won't let you die. Good luck with that, Peter, by the way. How are you gonna stop him from dying ever? Really probably what he's saying, hey, let's not risk it. Let's not even go down to Jerusalem. Let's avoid that. What's Jesus' response to Peter in that vulnerable moment? Do you remember? Get behind me what? Satan. Satan. He says, you're a stumbling block for me. What's he saying? I know what I need to do, and you're tempting me not to do it. Although Peter's desire was probably right, you know, it's love for, for his master, but yet at the same time, nothing he could have said was more contrary to Jesus' purpose, work, and will, and really in that moment, more supportive of Satan's effort to not die for man's sin. Then we come to Gethsemane, this moment. And although Satan is not directly mentioned, we see the Lord's anguish and desire not to go to the cross. And that little statement uh, uh, in the end, he says, not my will, but yours. We see a real temptation here. And logically, this is Satan's last chance, his last hope to act. Hopefully in that moment with the anguish, Jesus will tap out and say, I can't do it. As one author wrote, if that happened, If Satan succeeds in that, he says, then hell is the only place people will ever live forever. Heaven will be empty. God's word will be untrue. The promise of salvation will be a lie and Satan wins. Now the passage says that Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Why? Why was it such a deep sorrow? Well, a lot of it's the things I laid out, no doubt, the things that come up to this moment, which by the way, when we succumb to temptation and ultimately take a step into sin, almost always that actual step that we take into sin is just the end of a sequence of events that brought us to that place, that lead up to that moment. Very rarely uh, are we in the word and we're in prayer and we're in community and we're regularly examining our heart and we're regularly in repentance that we then take a gigantic sin to step into some huge sin. It's usually kind of a lead up of stepping away from the Lord that gets us there, or just even sometimes weakness and despair. So in his humanity, this buildup for Jesus, so far he's experienced the treachery of Judas, which he graciously ministered to for three years. He has the foreknowledge that the 11, other 11 are gonna uh, 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 deny him, and of course Peter is gonna completely in his, to his face say, I don't know you. He already had experience and he was going to experience more, the rejection of his own people, the Israelites, which he came to in the flesh to be their savior, redeemer, and king. And of course, he has this future knowledge of his physical mutilation from the beating, the whipping, and of course, the cross, the most excruciating death one could ever experience. The anguish is building. But with that said, what moves Jesus to cry out in verse 36, if you're there, 26, 36, he cries out, Father, In Mark, it says, Abba, Father, which means Dad. This is an intimate moment between him and the Lord, God the Father. He says, Daddy, I'm struggling. I know what's about to happen. If it's possible, he says, let this cup pass from me. What's he asking? See, what moves Jesus in the moment of desperation to say, Lord, uh, your will, not mine, is a foreknowledge of what he calls the cup. That's the anguish that really was building. What does he mean by cup? Well, throughout the Old Testament, God's wrath and judgment are often pictured as a cup to be drunk. This cup that Jesus asked to be removed isn't so much the physical suffering that he's going to have to endure on the cross, although no doubt that was part of it, but what's most daunting to Jesus in this moment is the thought of experiencing 
excruciating cup of God's fury. God's wrath that's going to be poured out against our sins, which the Son of God will take upon himself as a sacrificial lamb of God. We talked about this in depth when we were talking, walking through the end times, but we spent an entire Sunday looking at this word called propitiation. It means to satisfy, that there's gonna be a moment, it happened in turning past, that Jesus knows is gonna happen, that the sin of the world will then come on him. Scripture says he becomes sin, and in that moment, God's wrath will be poured out against his sin and kill the Son of God. Therefore, it will be satisfied. This cup, the wrath of God poured out on Jesus for our sin, for us, it's incomprehensible. That the Holy One, the one who never knew sin, was about to become sin and experience God's wrath, and then for the first time ever in eternity, past or present, he will experience a separation from God the Father because he becomes sin, a loneliness that none of us can ever understand, and that's why he cries out, why have you forsaken me? And so in this moment in the garden, with that foreknowledge, is there another way? Can you take this cup from me? And when he says, not what I will, but, will you, what, I, but what you will, as I said before, it, re, it just reveals the amazing fact that he was being tempted to not do the Father's will, which, by the way, is a simple definition of sin. If you ever want to know what sin is, the simple definition is not doing God's will. But Jesus did not succumb. Though sinless and perfect, he clearly was brought to real conflict of temptation, yet this is what Hebrews 4 says. For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Sometimes people say, well, just because he's perfect, he didn't experience the same temptation I have. That's not true. He is not, he, 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 we don't have one that's unable to sympathize, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Now to make this, let me, to make it clear, Jesus could have walked away from the cross at any time. Jesus clearly said, I lay down my life. No one forces me to lay it down. No one can take it from me. The Father sent Jesus to the cross, but he did not force him to go. Jesus was here asking if avoiding the cross was possible within the, the Father's redemptive plan and purpose. This idea, this anguish, this agony of becoming sin was becoming so unbearable in this moment because of his human weakness. The sinless Son of God before his father, daddy asks, is there another way? And if, if there is, <laughs> let's go that route. Now listen, there's a lot more here, a lot more that we could go into, but I wanna take the rest of our time to really dive into something I think is incredibly applicable to our daily life. Because what we really have here is a beautiful juxtaposition. We have a compare and contrast between failing and succeeding in the face of temptation, in the face of heartache, in the face of crisis. The disciples knew it was a time of crisis. They didn't like obliviously go into the garden lollygagging and fell asleep. Luke actually tells us they fell asleep because they were exhausted from sorrow. In the previous passage, Jesus told them, it's gonna get rough, you're gonna desert me. They said, no way, we will fight for you. And of course, they respond by saying, no way. We will go down with you. The point is they already knew that it was a time of difficulty and crisis. They knew it was coming. They knew that they were gonna need strength and courage to prevail. Jesus told them they were about to desert him. And Jesus also knew it was a time of crisis. And yet what we end up seeing is the disciples in the face of crisis, what do they do? They fall asleep. In the face of crisis, what does Jesus do? He prays. If there's ever an answer to living for the Lord, that's the answer. Your choices in the face of this life, in the face of difficulty is to fall asleep or to get on your knees and pray. So I guess the ultimate question is, if Jesus, the Lord of all, in his humanity, in the face of temptation, stress, and anguish, and crisis, sought power of God, the Father for strength and courage to move forward so that he could do what God had wanted him to do, how much more should the disciples, but yet even how much more should we? Amen? So this passage actually gives us a sequence that leads to spiritual tragedy that I just wanna highlight, because then we can see the answer to find victory. So let's look at what they did. What led to their spiritual tragedy, number one, was self-reliance. They claimed that they would be faithful to Jesus to the very end, yet we never, ever see them ask for help. You notice that? They believed they could do it on their own. 
They were certain they would never forsake Jesus or compromise his teachings, yet they believed somehow that sheer willpower or sheer desire would give them success. Another way to say it was pride, that I can do what is spiritual through my own resilience. Is that you? Good luck with that. I'm here to tell you, human resilience does not lead to spiritual success. It never does. And so almost inevitably, self-reliance will lead to number two, which is sleep. They go to sleep. Translation, I got this. There's no urgency, no need to work on it. I'll take a nap. For us, it really represents indifference, a lack of intentional spiritual vigilance in the face of crisis. Jesus finds them sleeping, and what does he say? Here's the solution to any uh, sin that we face. He gives them the solution. He says, watch and pray. Which, by the way, it's not watch and pray one time and then you're good to go. In the original language, it's actually watch and keep on watching, pray and keep on praying. In a physical example, what these guys are doing is trying to prepare for a marathon by sitting on the couch. To prepare to do what God's called them to do by doing nothing. I'll say it this way for you. When we're not paying attention to our spiritual eyes, when we're not purposely moving forward with Christ, when we're not spiritually vigilant, as I say all the time, listen to me, no one ever accidentally becomes more like Jesus. That's never happened. No one ever accidentally lives for the Lord. And you know what? No one ever accidentally, in the face of temptation, chooses to do what is right versus sin. It doesn't work that way. Because when we're not spiritually paying attention, although, uh, you know, paying attention through the regular reading of the word, through prayer, through service and community, even through self-examination, and then temptation comes to us when we're not being spiritually vigilant, that's when we get ourselves into all sorts of trouble. Years ago, I took a group of kids down to, uh, I was taking them to Colorado from Fresno. It's a couple day trip. And we were only two hours out of Fresno and we stopped. And like kids do, if you've ever been on a trip like this, they all piled out to Texaco Food Mart and they just bought as much candy as they possibly could. My wife had prepared for me a box, so I already had a box set up, so I didn't need anything. But I went into this Texaco, I can still see it right outside of Bakersfield, and I was walking around with a good friend of mine, Dustin Jasmajian. He bought some stuff and he got in line. It was pretty long, it was about 10 people. And as I was standing next to him, in the, the, the Texaco, a song came on that was popular at the time from Aladdin, A Whole New World. A whole new world, don't you dare close your eyes. And it, I just felt in the moment, and so I started to sing it, and I put my hand on his shoulder, I started playing with his ears, I serenaded ser- ser- a whole new world. And he grabbed my hand super violently, I don't know why, and then he threw it down, I'm like, geez, what's your problem? I looked up, it wasn't Dustin. <laughs> While I began to sing, the line moved. So I serenaded a whole new world and played with a trucker's ear from Bakersfield <laughs> that I'd never seen before. And quick response, trying to make it better, I said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were him. Like, that made it way better. <laughs> like a 14-year-old kid. And I just ran to the bus. What got me into trouble? I was not paying attention. We laugh, but if you're not every day vigilant, paying attention to your spiritual life and where you're at, we get into all sorts of trouble. What does it lead to? Well, temptation. Jesus tells us that we need to be ever always vigilant because the spirit is willing. We want to do what's right, but the body, the flesh is weak. And I guess the point I want you to hear is no matter where you are in the sequence of events, temptation is going to come to you today. It's going to come. The, the question is, is what kind of spiritual state are you in when it does? So when we're not in a good spiritual state, number four, it leads to sin. We choose sin. The reality is a believer is spiritually self-reliant and spiritually indifferent in their pursuit of God. When temptation, when temptation comes, they will fall. Which, number five, leads to disaster. Just as temptation will lead to sin, if we're not trusting God for help, and then we, we find ourselves in sin, if we don't confess it, if we don't get on it early and often, I promise you it will then grow and then become something that become habitual, and if you don't deal with it, there will be spiritual tragedy. I say this all the time, but I'll say it again. The earlier and more often you deal with sin in your life, the less damage it will always have. So no matter where you are in that step, deal with it now. Even if you're far down the road and it's gonna be brutal and difficult, it's still better now than if you wait. Well, because they were not prepared, because they did not watch and pray, 
we see them fall. And it's through this process that led to the desertion of Jesus. For Peter, because of this process, it led up to his outright denial and even tragedy. Yet, we also have in the story a pattern for victory. Jesus gave it to us. We see their pattern, but we see his victory. Simply defined, it's doing God's will in the face of difficulty. The best way to say how we're supposed to live as followers of God is living the word of God daily in the face of temptation. Living out the word of God in the face of temptation. It's interesting because Jesus told us how to pray. You know, watch and pray. Be vigilant how we're living our life and then be in prayer. He told us how to pray. Many of you know it, the Lord's Prayer, right? You might have recited it, but it really is an outline for how we're to pray. He says, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we're supposed to take time in the beginning of our prayer, give him praise. It's amazing if we just take time to give him praise and thanksgiving, what the Spirit does then for our souls. Then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's he asking there? He says, pray that the Spirit of the living God will help you do his will. Then it goes on to say, Give us our day, our daily bread. So that's an opportunity for you to ask the Lord for things that you're struggling with. And then, of course, forgive us as we forgive others. And then it goes on to say this, and lead us not into what? Here's a huge question for you. Do you have some kind of sin that you're struggling with in your life? Maybe something you've even identified that you don't wanna do? Huge question. Jesus told you, number one, pray that the God would help you do his will and pray that you be led away from temptation. Let me ask you, are you doing that? I think this is a Christian's everyday prayer. Like this is one of those things I think everyone here can do, that you wake up in the morning, put a ribbon on your ring or something on your mirror or whatever it is, and you take 30 seconds and just simply say, Lord, help me do your will today and lead me from temptation today. Why should we do that? Jesus told us to. And I think if we would do what he tells us to do, I think he's gonna bless it with the spirit of God in your life. My friends, the way to spiritual victory which breathes life is confidence in God rather than yourself. It's a pursuit of God in prayer rather than indifference. It's seeking him through the word of God rather than the next self-help book. Recognizing you can't resist, resist temptation on your own and so we don't try. The way to victory in the face of temptation is to resist it in the power of God through prayer and then biblical community. And then we find ourselves in sin with the help of others that we repent and he forgives. I guess the ultimate question is this. If Jesus, the son of God, while here on earth in his humanity, fought temptation through the power and diligence of prayer, how much more should we? Now with that said, I wanna address one more powerful point. He has this anguish, he has a face of temptation, he knows what he's supposed to do at the very end of the, the passage, it just simply says, rise, get up, it's time to go. And then what does Jesus do? He goes. Years ago, I, I'll never forget, if you remember the movie, The Matrix, some of you know it, some of you don't, it's a great movie, but anyways, I remember going to see it the first time and nobody had ever heard of it. I had no idea what it even was. It, was, it had not exploded yet. And I remember going, and it's this crazy movie. You're trying to figure it out. But there's this one moment, kind of climatic part of the movie where helicopters getting crashed and windows are being broken and people are falling off buildings and they say this guy named Morpheus. And in the craziness, this explosion, all this stuff happens, it gets real quiet. And Morpheus looks at the other main character, Neo, and he simply says this. There's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And I remember sitting in Edwards Theater, Fresno, California, and I went, boom, that is powerful. Sooner or later, you're gonna discover there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And the same is true in Christianity. There's a difference between knowing what God's will is. There's a difference between knowing how to be saved, knowing the direction God wants you to do, knowing what sin is and what it's not. There's a difference between knowing the Bible backwards and forwards and having all the right answers when someone talks to you about Christianity and actually doing those things and living that way. Jesus knew God's will. He knew what he was supposed to do. But there was a difference between Jesus knowing what he was supposed to do and actually doing it. What if he not? What does that mean to us? So let me ask, 
This is between you and the Lord. Do you know God's will? By the way, a lot of people come to me and ask me about God's will in their life, what college I should go to, who should I marry, all those kind of questions. And I will just simply tell you this. God has given you a revealed will in his Bible. And when you are living out his revealed will, the things you know you're supposed to do and not do, in the gray areas of life, they become so much easier to navigate. But when you're not living out the revealed will, man, the gray areas become difficult. And so if you don't know what God's will is, start with knowing the word of God. Start there. But the question really is, if you know God's will, are you living it out? You know, I was in the back when we were worshiping and I was just overwhelmed by the fact that you guys were so loud in worship. I could hear everyone almost more than I could hear our worship band. And as much as they're much better at it than you are, I really enjoyed listening to the, the people of God. But I have to admit, sometimes I think when I see the people of God assemble and they're just lifting their hands, I wonder in that moment if they're actually living the way God's called them to live. It's so easy to come in here and have a feel-good moment. It's much more difficult to live daily as God's called you to live. So if you're gonna do that, it won't happen on accident. You have to make decisions. You have to get into some kind of group life. You have to start reading the word on some kind of regular basis. You have to set up some kind of prayer life. And you have to set up a time where you're confessing sin on a regular basis. Because if you don't do those things and crisis hits, I promise you'll have spiritual disaster. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are and what you're doing in and amongst us. I would just pray, Lord, that you would just uh, help us as a people uh, live as you've called us to live. Lord, every, most of us in this room know you're calling, you know what we're supposed to do, but every one of us has that thing, whatever it is in our life, that we struggle with. And I just pray, Lord, as a people that we would lay it at your feet. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and God's people said,